and the success rate really only becomes very good from about three and a half. Um, so lots of practice that goes on between then and that's why these little games that you see and the wrestling and carrying on of these little cubs um, is so important because it's while it looks like fun and, and it is fun um, they are also learning as to how their body works and how they are able to move their legs and control everything and to be able to stalk and bounce and and to be able to work out how they can get away with catching one another without being seen so all vitally important you can see how that cub just came up now with one paw often when they're taking down an animal they'll use that paw to flick and, and to to try and um, trip an animal up and so it's all part of of learning but yes at around three years old typically be um would see them hunting um while we sit with these guys for a little bit longer, we're just going to see now that the sun is going down a little bit um, and it's starting to get a little bit cooler. I'm hoping that the females might start to get a little bit active again. They've, they've all sort of gone down, but I'm hoping as it gets a little bit cooler that they are going to. But we're going to link back to James and see what updates he's got for us. Um, I hope by now he's uh, managed to find some sort of sign of Sindile. I, I don't know where he is at the moment, but hopefully. Now, everybody, I haven't found Sandile, uh, nor have I found Shadow, nor Tingana, nor Karula. The latter three I have not found because they are not here. They are on Little Gari, all three of them uh, together. Now, that is unfortunate because I was rather hoping one of them would be here, but they are not. So now we are looking at the back end of a virtual zebra, which doesn't really want to say hello to us, does it, Brian? No. It's not very kind at all of it. It's so wooed at the Grand Zebra without even knowing about it. This particular one is the Southern Zebra, I suppose you'd call it, or the Birchall Zebra. But the Grand Zebra is the same species. It's just a slightly different shape. It's got a more Roman nose, and I'll show you here. And I didn't know this until, well, a few days ago. There's the Grand Zebra, and there's the Birchall Zebra. Now you can see the Birchall Zebra thicker of neck, the very obvious shadow stripes there, those are those sort of dotty bits there, the brown stripes in between the black and white. And if we go up towards the Grant Zebra there, you can see a much more rounded nose, and I definitely noticed that when I was there, much more rounded sort of Roman nose, if you like, and very little in the way of shadow striping. You can see that. There we are, Brian. That's very clear of you. Then the other thing, of course, is that they're striped all the way down to the foot. Looks like a sort of um, pile of potatoes there. What do you call those things? Potato chips. Yes, potato chips, exactly. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, that's the difference between the two. And Sabrina, you're wondering about wild horses. Now, before Brian goes away from this book, I'm going to show you one African wild horse-ish type thing called an African wild ass. There it is. Now, I am a bit of a horseman myself, Sabrina, and you know, when you're a judge of horse flesh, when you see something that looks like that, your first thought is not, what a brilliantly attractive animal, it's more, what a donkey. And so we don't actually have anything other, uh, or any other sort of wild equids, other than the zebras and the African wild ass. There are, however, quite a number of feral wild horses in Namibia and they've gone completely wild and they have quite an interesting story um, that begins with their sort of exclusion after the, I think it was the First World War if I'm not mistaken when Germany was tossed out of Namibia um, I think it was the First War they were tossed out of Namibia and the army couldn't take their horses with them so they just released them into the desert assuming that they would die and they've now produced a fairly large herd that roams all around the deserts or the sub-desert areas of Namibia. So that's quite nice. But otherwise, no wild horses in Africa. Because the horse, of course, if I'm not mistaken, comes... Where was it first domesticated? I think it was domesticated probably around Mongolia, where you still find the Preswalski's horse, which is the last remaining wild horse in the world. Now, we're just going to get out of the way here so that these fellows can come past us. Can you say Preswalski's horse, Brian? Preswalski's horse. Very nice, well done. <laughs> just wave 
friendly at these people. Hello, good afternoon. How's it going? Good. Now the good thing about them, Brian, of course, is that they were all in matching khaki, which means that they will be invisible to any of the animals that they come across. Yes. Now, our next port of call is going to be the Arethusa Dam, which is just down here. And I don't think there's any water in it. I'm always thoroughly amused by matching khaki outfits on the back of a safari vehicle, as if the uh, smell of diesel, petrol fumes, uh, steering fluid, oil and all of that could possibly be mitigated by the wearing of <laughs> some green coloured clothing like I've got on, for example. I'm tremendously camouflaged at the moment. <laughs> right, let's go across to the Arethusa waterhole. What? Oh, I didn't hear that. Ah, yes. Now, a very good point here being made by Louise in the final control, and that is that I am not nearly as camouflaged as Geraldine was yesterday in her giraffe onesie. I'd love to know where she got that. I also think that I would very much like to borrow it for game drive one day, so maybe she will lend it to me and I can wear a giraffe onesie on game drive. The most amusing part of wearing a giraffe onesie, and Geraldine thinks that's a very good idea, and she got it from China apparently, well that's not unusual, but apparently the most amusing thing about it of course will be, well not only your reactions, but mostly when driving past someone like that fellow who's taking his game drive very seriously, if he were to come across me in a giraffe onesie, um, I think um, I think he'd be rendered utterly speechless to be honest. I think he'd just look once and just keep driving. <laughs> Brian, I think we should get you a giraffe onesie as well. Especially as you actually are as tall as a giraffe. Maybe I should get a dwarf mongoose onesie. Or a zebra onesie, that's a very good idea. Jerry, can we get a zebra onesie? Or a crowned lapwing onesie? Jerry is so excited now, everybody, she can't contain herself with the thought of Brian and I going out on drive in a giraffe onesie and a zebra onesie. <laughs> ah, now we know we've come to the end of the water when the harbinger of doom is at the water's edge. Do you see him there, Brian? Oh, no, left and up. And left. And no, and left again. <laughs> there. Just keep going along there. Oh, look at him. South Africa's ugliest bird. The marabou stork. We will get a bit close, everybody. I just wanted to warn you that the harbinger of the drought is at the water. Now what he's doing, I'm obviously being ridiculously overdramatic on the Sunday afternoon, what he's doing is eating the rotting carcasses of the catfish that are no longer able to swim because the mud has now dried. Some of them would have been, would be under the mud now in their sort of safe slimy cocoons from which they will emerge when the water comes again, but many of them will be in the gullet of that their bird. Let's go and take a look. Do you think you can get a marabou stalk onesie? With a traffic cone as the, uh, as the beak. Monique in London, you say, have I seen any kingfishers today? Uh, I haven't. And you say, you've just taken a walk along the river. I'd love to know which river that was. I suppose it must be the Thames. Hey, it's not pronounced like that, is it, Brian? No, no the Thames. I imagine it must have been the Thames or a tributary thereof. Oh, the River Mole. 
I don't know where the River Mole is, it sounds very wind in the willows-ish. And you say you saw three kingfishers there. Now one of them took off and relieved itself on taking off and you immediately thought of me. Um, thank you, I think. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. And I say there's something, um, it's interesting, when, you, I, when I go to somewhere like Britain or to Europe, the gentleness of the wilderness is uh, is always apparent, and it's. Uh, I think a lot of people under underrate or yeah certainly underestimate the uh, healing effect of a wilderness like that, where you're not looking over your shoulder for something that might come and knock you over at any stage. And the sort of wind in the willows type of wilderness, which is great as well. Now you can just uh, we just quickly pan down over this mud bath from which there is no escape for the fish and the hippopotamus has gone look at that everybody I've never seen it like that in all my 18 months that I've been here <laughs> Louise, I'm afraid the comms are absolutely horrendous here. I can't hear you. There is a blacksmith lapwing. And there's also an impala. And there are two impalas. Alrighty, we're going to carry on from here. I think we're probably going to head back towards Juma now. Not much going on in Arethusa this particular afternoon. Uh, let's head back to the lions with Tristan and find out what they're doing other than sleeping. Welcome back guys. Well James, not many of them are sleeping unfortunately. Moms are trying and babies are being quite boisterous and so not too much sleep going, going on on this side of the, the reserve. But I believe you were talking about onesies. Now James, I think I might be able to solve your little onesie problem. My other half, Ali, who some of you may know from a drive she did a few weeks ago, um, has a zebra onesie and being that James and Ali are of similar height, I actually think James might fit into it. So, what we will have to do is try and get James his little zebra onesie and make him do a drive in it. And I think that's a very fine idea. Mm. Um, if I had to be in a onesie myself, as sitting with these lions, I think I've been quite inclined to go lion. Obviously the beard would be very mane-like and so I would be lost in a lot of other animals. Um, and these days with all the lodge food, and well, I believe James is very excited about this uh, zebra onesie. We definitely need to make this happen. Um, unfortunately, I'm going on leave for a few days, James. So when I get back, that will be uh, time for you to don the onesie. It might be a quite a warm experience, though, out here. I think I would advise you do it in the mornings. Um, but yes, um, I think uh, a zebra onesie on James might be a good idea. So while you guys were away, a couple of the little ones went up to that female over there that you guys are seeing and tried to have a suckle. There was quite a lot of growling and hissing and at one point even a little firm push of the head by mom to get out the way. She then stood up and they were all sitting in the shade begging for milk and she absolutely did not tolerate that for one second, showed her teeth and used her head and barged all the little ones out the way and then proceeded to lie promptly in the shade. And so since then, these two have been scrapping it out in the sunshine. Um, but isn't it glorious with that golden light that is now hitting them? It is the most beautiful sighting, eh? Wow. We have been so spoiled this afternoon with these guys. And from what I've heard and what I've seen, you guys have been getting very spoiled with them for the last few weeks. It is the most incredible thing to be able to watch these little lion cubs develop and grow. And to watch their day-to-day -day antics is the, one of the most special things. Um, and so all of you that are watching, I hope you will continue to join and to continue to, to watch Safari Live. And, um, follow the process and follow the the progress of these little ones as they go through their youthful age and start to become little adults um, and hopefully one day in in the future that we even see some of them making it to adulthood and having cubs of their own or becoming big strong coalitions that could potentially then move on into other areas but that process would be the most incredible amazing thing to watch and for you guys to be able to witness that on a day-to-day -day basis is something that is incredibly incredibly special um, 
being a guide and who's been out here for a very long time, I think it is one of the probably the biggest rewards of being a guide is to be able to sit and see the progress of animals and to be able to spend time with them in their natural environments as little babies like this and watch them develop and their characters develop into these incredible um, adults that we see. Um, if you think of the likes of Amber Eyes in the, in the Nkuhuma Pride, um, then you've got the Queen Karula and so all of these little, uh, all of these ladies were once this size and uh, the fact that you guys are here now and able to to witness this and to watch this process is quite quite something so amber from michigan would like to know if all five of the female cubs that are are in the Nkuhuma Pride currently, if they all make it to adulthood, would those five join the other five adult females we currently have, or would they split into another pride of their own? Well, um, generally the case is, is that those five females will absorb into the pride and form a pride of their own, although in a pride that I've seen um, to the southwest of us, there was a case where the females have split away from uh, the pride members and have formed their own breakaway uh, pride and so actually it's possible but I would be quite surprised if these five did end up leaving the the mothers I'm pretty sure that they will be joined into the in Kahuma pride and the pride will grow to 10 um, and can you imagine 10 adult females in one pride together um, what an, a machine they will be and how potent they could be at uh, bringing down these large buffalo that they'd like to hunt um, and can you imagine also if all 10 had have, have cubs, it would be absolute chaos. They've got their hands full with just eight. Can you imagine 10 females with four cubs each? That would be absolute chaos. But here's to hoping and to, to seeing all five of them staying alive firstly to become adults um, and then to be joining into the Inkuhuma Pride and becoming a serious force within the northern Sabi Sands. Oh, that little elephant ball has taken an absolute pounding today. Um, these little guys have dragged that little ball all over the place. Um, that poor piece of dung has lost multiple little limbs as it's gone along. Um, well, now we're just going to fight with each other over the top of it. Um, luckily, that little elephant ball of dung has no heartbeat, and so I'm sure it doesn't care at all of, a, of its situation and predicament currently. Um, but it's amazing how little balls of dung can become the center of eight lions' focus. Just look at that. Uh, isn't that the most incredible thing? Now, if that is not cute, I don't know what is. Oh, we've got a claw stuck on the forehead. And off we go. Back to the ball we go. So you can see the biting there, the rolling. Oh, that is the cutest little cub. They are so fluffy. Um, after seeing the little sticks cubs, it's actually quite scary to see how fluffy these guys are and how healthy they're looking in comparison um, they are incredibly incredibly beautiful but it also sheds a little bit of concern onto what the sticks look like they're not looking fantastic these days um, but luckily we are with these guys and we are getting to be spoiled by the the good looking gang of of juma Just when we thought the fight was over, it carries on again. There's always that one sibling that is incredibly naughty and likes to jump all over the others and cause trouble. And I can guarantee that it'll be the same sibling that will run to mom when things get out of control. It's normally the case and it's normally one of the younger siblings. I know this because I was like that at the early ages of a boy. Um, I used to piss and, and poke and prod my brother until I got a reaction and then would run to mom with complaints of being beaten by my now thoroughly irritated brother and I can imagine that this is very much the case amongst these guys but look at that that is just so sweet oh I'm gonna be up and mobile now oh little sneeze so I think probably rubbing up on one another a little bit of fur has gotten up the nose there and has ended up causing this little one to have a little sneeze Just look at those little faces. Wow.
So we have a question from Shanae. Hello, Shanae. Welcome. Um, Shanae is a guide um, very close by and one a lady that we guide with quite regularly. So she knows the Styx comes quite well and she wants to know will the Nkuhumas pick up mange like the Styx have? Well, it is possible um, given that the mange that the Styx got um, was spread by the Birmingham males. They were the ones that had it first, it then transferred onto the females and then across onto the cubs. Um, so potentially if these Birmingham boys go and spend time with these Styx females again and get reinfected and get a lot more of the mange on them, they could potentially pass it to one of the females if they mate here and those females then rub up on the cubs and it could potentially spread that way. As it stands currently, looking at these cubs and looking at the females, there doesn't seem to be any sign of mange developing on them. So I would imagine at this stage, no, we will not see any uh, uh, manged on them and I hope that that stays the, the, the case um, but yes it is potentially possible Shanae. So you can see an approaching vehicle is now the highlight of the afternoon all of them are busy watching and checking around what's going on. Um, very interested in this large hunking piece of metal that is making its way through the brush so loudly. Um, obviously with animals generally it's a very quiet process when they move around but us humans in our vehicles tend to to make quite a bit of noise so that's always a little um, something to be interested in particularly when you're a youngster and this is a very new situation to you um, as a adult female you can see in the background she does not care one bit and the vehicles have become part and parcel of her daily life but the little cubs are still very interested in this whole process and the movement of these vehicles oh i've got a little itch on the side of the face there from the youngest <laughs> and now we're biting our own foot well, when nobody else wants to play, I suppose playing with one's foot is quite fun. So, so Sarah from Florida would like to know whether little baby lions have sharp teeth that they will lose and will then uh, get their adult teeth. Yes, Sarah, they do. They have small little teeth that um, will grow. Um, and slowly but surely those will grow out and new ones will come through that are a lot bigger and stronger and will be able to cope with the crunching of bone and meat as they go through life. Um, at the moment these are all little milk teeth and they are still very sharp and pointy um, but yes they will become larger and bigger as time goes. So even the little cubs, you saw how some of them scattered quickly behind mom. Just shows you how even though they are so relaxed and they are wandering around playing that there's still this very sort of clever instinct that when something gets close and they're not sure to run to mom and hide behind mother. At the end of the day mom is going to protect them more than anything else and so it's a very clever strategy to stay alive and one that they're going to need in time um, especially when they start to venture towards carcasses like buffalo kills and you get hyenas approaching the the instinct to run to where the nearest female is or to their mother is going to be a very good one that's going to keep them alive in the long run so they need to be very aware of that and, and need to be able to keep doing it through these adolescent years oh, threat is over and now it's back to playtime again So Timberland would like to know is is a breakaway of female lions from a pride because there is a, a lack of food that the, the pride is being able to catch because of the numbers. Yes, that can be the case sometimes um, when you get very large prides. Um, I've seen prides in the eastern parts of Kruger National Park that are 40 lions together. And when there's 40 lions, you can imagine things like zebra and wildebeest don't go very far. Um, and so what they end up doing is having to uh, break apart so that the, the prides can find enough food for one another. 
The prides that I was referring to earlier in terms of them moving and, and, and breaking apart was actually more to do with males. Um, a new coalition of males arrived and that female, um, she basically took these um, little cubs away and she raised them by herself. Oh, hello. We've got a bit of movement from the male. Welcome. And maybe he's not to be outdone by the cubs, is going to put up on a little performance of his own. So a little bit of scratching there. This male is actually one of the males that had the mange. I don't know if you guys can see on his belly there. There's a little bit of lack of fur there. And so he was one of them that had it quite badly. It's recovered very, very well. It seems to have uh, grown a bit of fur there and it's looking a lot, lot better. So hopefully he's not still carrying too many of those little mites. Um, also, his contact with the cubs is so little that hopefully there's not going to be too much transference of those mites onto them. But that does look like an epic scratch. Look at that face. That is a face of pure enjoyment. He has got his back leg busy scraping along his belly. And whatever was itching has obviously been relieved very nicely by doing so. And we're going to turn around and lick our tail. Right, so much the same process as what we saw with the, the females and the cubs earlier. When they tend to get up and get moving, there's often a lot of grooming that goes on. And that's all just to get rid of any loose fur or parasites like I was talking about earlier that may have gotten onto them during the time that they've been lying down. Um, also, if there's any old wounds or wounds that are leaking, that they can clean those up. But generally, it's just to keep the body in good condition. But it's amazing how supple he is for such a big animal. Now, imagine trying to turn your head around towards your backside. It won't be an easy process. I'm sure there are some yoga people out there that may be able to do it. But for me, I don't think that would be possible. So, well done, sir. You are doing a fine job at keeping yourself clean. Obviously, practicing quite often. Now, I'm hoping that once he's finished his grooming process that he might take a wander closer towards the, the females and the cubs and that we get a little bit of interaction between them. Um, obviously, like I say, there's not too much going on um, with, with the male. So Dingo is asking me, she says that from where she's sitting, that this Birmingham boy is not very big. Well, yes, he is still a youngish male, and there might be a little bit of room for growth, but not very much. He's pretty much at his biggest. His mane might get a lot thicker, but I can tell you from sitting not even 10 feet away that he is a large cat. Um, he is quite a big boy. Um, he's not the biggest male lion I've seen, but he is definitely, definitely not small. Um, and he is quite, quite intimidating. He's got these beautiful eyes when he looks at you. And uh, while he might not be the biggest lion out there, the fact that he's got three other brothers allows him to be quite dominant in this area. And so he is not the smallest of, of uh, lions that I've ever seen either. Um, but yes, he's not the biggest either. What he is, though, is a very happy lion right now. It looks like he's uh, just enjoying the coolness of the afternoon. Uh, it's, like I said, it's, the temperature has dropped quite nicely and there's this beautiful breeze blowing that is very cool, particularly if you're sitting in the shade um, like he is. He's going to be very, very happy with life. Um, but let's just see where he goes. So while this Birmingham continues to alleviate these itches and to get rid of whatever is troubling him, um, we're going to go back to James and see what updates he's got. Oh, hang on. Let's just see where he goes to here. Busy sniffing around. Maybe we'll even get him sniffing one of the bushes around here and give us a phlegm and grimace that we were talking about earlier. Oh, that skink might be in trouble now. Luckily, it's a male and he's not too interested in skinks. Um, and the skink has made a hasty retreat anyway from earlier. But let's see where he goes. The cubs are very interested too as to where this male is off to. Um, you see them kind of skulking behind there, watching this male. And what is this hulking great hairy animal doing? And all he is doing is going to another spot to lie down. So while he lies down and we 
carry on looking and, and seeing what these guys are up to. I'm pretty sure at this time of the day, like I said, that they're going to start getting up. And the fact that the mail is up is a good sign. We're going to cross back to James and just get an update for now. And hopefully when you get back, maybe the lines will be up in mobile and we can show you a little bit more. Cordon Bleu. That is a uh, blue waxville, everybody, and in East Africa, where I spent, well, the better part of three days last week. They are known as the Cordon Bleu, and there are a number of different kinds of Cordon Bleu that you can get there, Brian. Mm. And the great advantage of having a bird uh, that is called a Cordon Bleu is that you're able to say... Cordon Bleu! Exactly! And this is a wonderful flock of little cordon bleu. They're all trying to find the last bits of seed there in the seed bed. Oh wow, look at that, isn't that beautiful? What a very special cordon bleu sighting, Brian. Look, even their beaks are slightly blur. See that? Mostly black, but a little bit blur. <laughs> That's a female we're looking at there. And the male is a lot more blur than the female. The female is very pale blur. The male, a bit blur. -er. <laughs> and as, you know what, as with the... Uh, the lilac breasted roller you see how the back end there yeah, that's a male there you see how the back end is camouflaged so if they want to turn if they feel afraid they can turn away and kind of huck, nunk, hunker down into the leaf litter and become almost invisible I got stuck between knuckle and hunker there and became nunka which of course isn't really a word is it Brian no there's Mrs. Cordon Bleu and Mr. Cordon Bleu. Mr. is bigger, isn't he? A bit. He's a larger fellow than she. And all birds, basically, at this time of the year, will eat whatever they can find. So they'll eat ants if they can find them on the ground there. They'll eat termites if they can find them. But as I've said before, there are quite a lot of grass seeds underneath the surface of the soil, and if you know where to look, and a cordon bleu does know where to look, you can find some seeds to eat. But I think they're probably, because they're underneath the bushes there as opposed to out in the open, I think you'll probably find that they're looking for ants. I think this is the most spectacular sighting, everyone. I really love this. And as you say, Kathy, that blue is really exquisite. Now, I'm no artiste, and I don't know, I, know, I would just describe that as light blue. Uh, I'm cobalt, is it cobalt? Thank you, Brian. Brian reckons a little bit lighter than cobalt. Bird bordering on turquoise, yes. Just a little flash of colour. I suppose it's much like that little flash of green there. It is so much more impressive when it's surrounded by the greys and browns. <laughs> I don't know. I find this absolutely fascinating. What are they eating? That's a seed. He is picking up grass seeds, you know. And that first he picked up the orm of something called a three orn. There, that's another one. It's an Aristida grass species. The orn, that's the sort of long bit there, isn't the seed. The seed hangs underneath the orn. He looks like he's had quite a lot to eat, doesn't he, Brian? A very good Sunday lunch, as that Cordon Bleu had. Oh. Too much apple crumble for you, chum. Yep, definitely just eating the seeds. And the accuracy with which that little conical-shaped bill grabs the seeds 
and de-husks them in a couple of little bites and then swallows the nutritious oily seed within is amazing. Hello, Run Far Away Billy Blues. That's a quite astounding name. Uh, you say, how come some of them have got red on their cheeks? They don't hear. But there is one called a red-cheeked cordon bleu that is found in East Africa. And you see that, Brian? There is the red-cheeked cordon bleu, and we don't get them here. I'll just show you a picture of the bird. That's a really nice question. Uh, so that's the red cheek. The male's got the red cheek. So he is absolutely um, uh, de designated by his red beak, but you, at least his red cheek. But you can also see they've got red bills. They're not quite the same as these ones, but that's his distribution. So that's <laughs> absolutely useless if you don't know what we're looking at here. <laughs> that's Tanzania there, Kenya at the top, Lake Victoria there. There we are. You don't need to worry about that. Now, I think ours is the Southern Cordon Bleu. There it is there, otherwise known as the Blue Wax Bill. And you can see male just slightly more bleu than female. <laughs> Only found in Tanzania and down here. So that's just a map of East Africa. This is the East African Bird app. Did you see how dismissive I was there of my of my technology. So yeah, so dismissive. Right. On we on we go. Things are taking a slightly bizarre streak. Now, Helen, you see this is a very good question from you and I don't know the answer in the same way that I don't know the answer and I have yet to hear anything satisfactory about why it is that birds of male and female should be the same color and should be brightly colored. You say, is it a sexual selection characteristic? My immediate thought is no, it isn't. It is as far as the sunbirds go, uh, because they are, the female is drab, the male is not. The obvious, most obvious example of that being a peacock. I don't understand it with the uh, cordon bleu. I don't understand it with the lilac-breasted roller, any of the roller species. I don't understand it with all of the bee-eater species, which are very brightly colored, both male and female. And I've yet to hear an explanation for what evolutionary adaptation that can, or what evolutionary advantage, both male and female being that color could possibly confer. I've read one or two sort of uh, ridiculous theories, uh, many of which are much like the theories that are put forward for why zebras have stripes. Uh, most of them you'd have to be, well, you'd have to be fairly well oiled to believe. Ooh, a great number of dwarf mingus. You see them there, Brian? Yes. Just in front of the aerial there. That's a lovely kind of metronomic feature we have on the vehicle. and the fork-tailed drongo, whose forked tail is not a sexual selection characteristic. For example, that forked tail is purely there because it's very effective when it spreads. It's a highly effective rudder. They're amazing birds, as you know. They're very common, they're very aggressive, and they're very fun to watch. Isn't that nice? And his beautiful red eye. The second bird we've seen with the Shiraz red eye today. The other one being the Shikra, who's building a nest on Zay's Road not too far from here. He is uh, constantly poking fun at me about my weight gain over the last year of being in a lodge. Um, so, yes, I might just be eating more than the carnivores at this stage. Um, so not much has changed really. The, the cubs are still playing. Lots of sticks have been picked up. Lots of sticks have been paraded around in front of one another, almost as a gesture of my stick is bigger than your stick. Um, this little chap that's just joined now has, has been one of the most active. He's been all over the place um, and has been causing a little bit of chaos. Um, 
but you can see that the activity in the cubs is not waning through the day. Unfortunately, the females are still really fast asleep at this stage. Not too much active um, activity from them, and the male is exactly where we left him when you guys uh, were last with us, which is right over there. Um, still fast, fast asleep. Um, so, still not too much in the way of activity yet. The sun is peaking um, just on the edge of the horizon now. Um, Dave, you might have seen it as Dave went past there just now. Um, and it's starting to get to that beautiful, beautiful time. Um, and so I really am still hoping that these females are gonna decide to, to possibly make a move. Um, like I was saying earlier, it is a lot cooler now. Um, and with this little breeze, maybe the scent of some um, animal drifts in the wind onto us here, it is coming from our north at the moment. Um, and so hopefully there'll be a scent of maybe a buffalo or something that might spark a little bit of action. Or the fact that they're just going to go and look for some water. Obviously on hot days like this, it's quite pertinent for these uh, little cubs and, and mothers to get uh, fluids, particularly the moms, they're producing a lot of milk. Um, as we've seen with these little guys suckling all afternoon and so water is a huge huge part of it Gregory I am so, so, so glad that we can form part of your bucket list. Um, I think for many, many people out there, a safari is on the bucket list. And, and while it is amazing to be able to come out here in person, for you guys to be sitting here and joining us live and having this interactive experience is something absolutely phenomenal. Um, I was saying earlier that I really can't get my mind around it. Um, the fact that we are broadcasting all over the world and, and uh, people like yourselves are able to watch this is just absolutely, absolutely amazing. So, you know, I'm glad that you're with us. I hope you're enjoying it. It's been a beautiful afternoon with these lions. Um, and I hope for one day that you will be able to achieve your bucket list and come to uh, Africa on your own accord and come and see these animals in real life. But for now, we are happy to have you with us and, and hope that you will stay with us um, going forward and, and continue to watch as this pride develops, as well as all the other exciting things that we get to see on a day-to-day -day basis. That is just the most beautiful little cub. Still got the little spots on the head. Oh, oh what do we have there? A stick by the looks of it again. Which is being moved around by the cub in the background who's playing with the stick. So we have lines on each end of the stick at this stage. And another bundle of them over there, which are still having a fantastic little game. I wish I had the energy of these little guys. They seem to never stop. Um, they just go and go and go and go. Um, I would imagine that's because they're getting a lot of nutritious milk from these females at the moment, and so energy abounds, um, and also youthful exuberance. Um, they have not yet learnt um, to store their energy, and, and the fact that they're not hunting would also typically signify that they can spend a lot of energy playing. Uh, the females tend to sleep like that just to conserve what energy they do have So with, when they are hunting, which obviously requires huge amounts of energy when they are sprinting and chasing and wrestling with animals, and so that's why they tend to conserve, and the cubs don't have that problem, so they can expend their energy in the forms of games. And like I say, that poor little stick has got a line on each end of it. I would not like to be that little stick right now. My stick. We are now going to have a war over the stick. And there we go. <laughs> As you can see, there's no respect for uh, personal space here when it comes to the stick game. Stick game means that everybody gets involved and we all pull. And whoever is strongest and biggest should win this game. Um, and, oh, lost grip there. Oh, there's a tail emerging. <laughs> Look at that. All very, very interested in the goings on as the vehicles reposition themselves. Um, the stick has been forgotten about for now. We 
look at those little eyes. They're, oh, isn't that a most precious moment? They've just kind of locked onto one another and oh, now I've got the one by the cheek. <laughs> look at that. Isn't that incredible, guys? No, you will not bite me. Stay away. Now, many a rugby player would be quite proud of that handoff. Um, in rugby, there's a, a maneuver which men will use is to try and push the opponent away using their hand, and that was quite a successful one, I would say. Don't you just love how, even when they are not really focused on the game, that they still push their paws into the faces and and uh, end up. So X Ranger would like to know if the questions we receive on Safari Live are very different to that of a game drive. Um, no, they are not actually. They are pretty much the same questions that we would get. Um, I think the thing is here is that a lot of you are very knowledgeable about the pride structure and, and the animals that you're seeing on a daily basis for the, you know, those of you who are regular viewers. Um, but yes, the questions are very similar to what we see on a, or what we get on a day-to-day -day basis from regular guests. Um, there's really no difference. Um, I think everybody is curious and everybody has the same kind of um, thoughts about animals and so very, very similar. And isn't that just the most amazing thing? We're on our back, legs all in the air, stick in the mouth. That is just pure heaven. Blissful moment right there. So we're just going to move forward slightly. Um, one of the other vehicles is going to just come in behind us here. Just going to roll forward a little bit. So Misty would like to know how many litters a lioness can have in her lifetime. Well Misty, it's also a very difficult question to answer because it will all depend on the successfulness of her cubs. Um, if she raises a litter successfully, she, then generally she won't be breeding for about two years. Um, should she lose her cubs, she will come into her Easter cycle within a few weeks, sometimes even two or three, um, and will be mating again. Um, and so she can produce quite a few litters and, um, in her lifetime, um, particularly if she's not a very successful mother. Um, but generally they will start to breed from about three and a half to four years old with their first litter normally around four. Um, and then like I say it depends on, on the amount of male coalitions that we get through the area and the amount of uh, fatalities that she has within the litters um, she produces. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Oh, we've got very, very, very brave Franklins that have just joined the fray. I don't know if you see them at the back there. I'm not sure if I was a Franklin, I would go walking into a pride of five female lions and eight cubs. We have some cubs that have awoken. The females are not interested, but there is one cub just to the left there that is beginning to stalk these little Franklins. Look, there they go. After the Franklins, yes, anything that moves is always a game, so this should be fun. Um, the Franklins are making a hasty retreat. They are busy running away. There they go. There's the little cubs. The Franklins have gone towards a big drainage line, and there they come. Here we go. Now you can see, even at little cubs, the instinct to chase and to move after moving things is there. Um, now it's all probably more game than anything else at this stage. I don't think they're really hunting, um, but the instinct to chase moving objects has already started at such a young age. It seems like the Franklins have disappeared into a little deep gully that's full of prickly spiny trees and so I think that cub has thought better of it and has just stopped on the bank there. But that was quite interesting. And like I say, a very brave set of Franklins. The rest of the cubs were not too perturbed by it. I think the fact that the Franklins made a hasty retreat into any chance of all eight of them participating in that one. There were some vultures circling to the north of her and she was constantly looking up at these vultures and she started to really stride. Um, and I was actually with one of the wild earth viewers, Michael Moss, I hope he's watching. Um, but if he isn't, he was with me at the time. 
and he was actually about to leave that morning um, and so we were pressed for time but we decided we'll just risk uh, breakfast and we'll just carry on with this lioness in the hope that she might be going somewhere we had noticed that when she started walking that it looked like there was a few little suckle marks there so there was this hope that maybe she's going to take us to the cubs and so we followed her for about 45 minutes as she weaved through the thickets and eventually she got onto a road and she started to head more and more to the areas that she used to have her cubs and the excitement grew as we went um, and soon she cut off the road into this little thicket and we followed her through this thicket and as we got to the other side of this thicket in a little clearing there was this little round section of rocks and she started to call and as she started to call the most tiny little lion cub appeared through these boulders it was so small that its eyes weren't even open yet and we estimated that it was probably anywhere between four and seven days old which is incredibly small the mother then went up she picked the little cub up and moved it and then lay down and began to suckle. It was the most spectacular sighting that I have ever had in terms of a mother and a cub interaction. And like I say, since we're with the cubs and, and, and the lions, I thought that would be an excellent one to, to refer to. But yes. I think any time spent with little animals is always a highlight for me. Um, and like I say, there's been a number of other very, very interesting sightings. I've had some great sightings of rare animals, things like pangolins and hard fox. Um, but in terms of a memorable sighting, I think that is probably one of the most memorable I'll ever have. And the likelihood of me achieving that again is probably not going to be uh, very high to follow a lion to a den of, and to see a cub of that age. Um, is incredibly special. It's very, very trusting of the lioness to take me towards her den after four days or five days of having that little cub. Um, was an incredibly, incredibly special moment. Well, there goes one cub with a big ball of dung again. All right, guys. But while we still wait for these lionesses to do something and these cubs uh, with us and how they're entertaining us. We're going to go back to James and see what update he's got for us. Well, you won't believe it, everybody. We found another hippopotamus, such as our unspeakable skill. Isn't it amazing, Brian, how skillful we are? So, so skillful. So skillful. Uh, a hippopotamus, everyone, about which we were asked earlier regarding elephants and their conflict. This chap lives in this pan, and he certainly was tossed out yesterday by the elephants that came down to drink. I don't think there's been a huge amount of elephant activity here today and so he is resting quite comfortably there. On his back there is an injury possibly brought on by his exposure to the sun and <laughs> feeding from the trough formed by that injury an ox pecker having his Sunday dinner. Mmm. Hippo blood. Delicious. Yes, I'm not sure I'd like to eat it, but I mean, I suppose if you're an ox picker, that is your want. Then there's also a really lovely little gathering of the birds of peace, humble birds there, the doves, the ring-necked doves, most of them come down to have a drink on a Sunday afternoon. Not sure why I need to say Sunday afternoon in that uh, North Country accent, but you know, it's just the way it is ring-necked doves all drinking away. Now, the ring-necked dove, humble as it might be, is actually astonishingly fast off the mark. They're very quick to fly off, and they have to be, because in some parts of Africa, especially in Namibia, they come down in huge numbers, and parts of the drier parts of Botswana. They'll come down this time of the, year, of the night, and they'll all drink together. And lurking in the bushes or high in the sky will be a lana or peregrine falcon. And those falcons, as you know, dive at an astonishing speed, about 220 kilometers an hour, if I'm not mistaken. That's about 140, 150 miles an hour they hurtle out of the sky. And these doves have to be able to get up into the air and to top speed within seconds when the falcon starts to come out of the sky and they managed to do that amazingly successfully so humble as they might be and numerous as they may be their numerousness or commonness common 
commonality, commonest, uh, common, the fact that there are lots of them. Uh, the fact that there are lots of them is a testament to the fact that they are very speedy and very effective at staying out of harm's way. Is it commonness, Brian? What is the word I was looking for? Commonness? Yes, the noun from the word common. Common. I don't know either, Brian. Abundance would have been a better word. Hello, Benjamin. You want to know when the migratory species of bird come back? Benjamin, they come back at 11.30 on the 8th of September, all of them. I'm obviously being completely facetious, Benjamin. They come back in drips and drabs from about now. Uh, so we've just had the Wahlberg's eagle back. That's normally the first. Uh, we've seen two or three of them. They were the first ones. The woodland kingfisher, which is our favorite, or one of our favorite migrants, the harbinger of the summer, come back as late as November. This last year, 16th of November, they came back. And in between that time, we'll get all the bee eaters back, some of the other kingfishers will come, the steppe eagle, the lesser spotted eagle, the red-backed shrike, the willow warbler, and various other w birds like that will come back over that interval. So between now and kind of November time is when they'll all come back. I don't know if any bird will actually arrive at 11.30 on the 8th of September, but it is possible. <laughs> And you say, I mustn't lie, I haven't budged the whole afternoon, it's the same hippo. <laughs> and um, I would say that that was a fairly, fairly good guess, but for the fact that when I ask Brian to uh, zoom out, you will see that we are, in fact, in a different situation. You see, we're at the Juma Dam Cam now, we're not at Red Dam anymore. Thank you, Anne, for casting aspersions on my character, I shall not forgive you for that. All right, everyone, you're going to, that's it going to, well, that is going to be it from us live on the vehicle. We're going to make our way to the fireside, and while we do that, we're going to hand you over to the veteran of the Sabi Sand, uh, Mr. Tristan Dix, and find out how he and the lions are going. Well, thank you, James. I'm not sure what to take from this. I've been called a youngster, and now I'm a veteran. Um, so I'm a little bit confused, but James and I will sort that out later. Um, like I say, we'll uh, have a little discussion. Um, but as you guys can see on your monitors there, there is the most spectacular colours illuminating the sky at the moment. Um, the sunsets mixed with the dust from the drought that we've been having, as well as some fires in the far east outside of the reserve, have caused these colours to really come alive. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, and as we come out there, you can see the deep blues are starting. Um, and slowly but surely, the night is starting to set in. Um, and look at that. Isn't that the most beautiful sight? That, accompanied by what is lying beneath that sun, which is these beautiful lions. They are still at the games and still chomping away at sticks. Um, they are still chomping at the sticks and still busy chewing and carrying on. But they are still at the games. Um, still no movement from the, the females at this stage, nor the male. Everybody is very, very fast asleep at this stage. So I don't know if we're going to get too much in the way of activity from them, but these cubs have been absolutely priceless this afternoon. Their games and their shenanigans have kept us all entertained um, the whole afternoon, and it has been an absolute privilege to spend time with them. You know, there's one cub now that has just got complete access to mom. Oh, hello, mom. As we speak, maybe she is going to sit up for us. No, back to sleep we go. Um, so there's one little cub that's trying to get some milk. She is now on the third nipple. She has tried two others and nothing has come from those two. So she is now trying her third one. Um, oh, I think we have success. She seems to have latched on and is quite happy with that one there. And is now just repositioning herself and getting ready to have a good long suckle. Oh, mom's tail is now being attacked. I don't think this game is going to last long at all. There we go, I thought not. Mom is not very fond of the tail being pulled. 
um, and so that game came to an abrupt halt. Um, and I think if my tail was being pulled too, I would also be quite upset with life. Um, now the little growls and grunts of the, the younger ones playing has attracted the attention of two of the others who were busy feeding from their mother and they've now started to come in and stalking along slowly. Let's see if they get involved here as well. But look at this little one with the stick, eh? See how it's positioned it and moved around. Oh, it's amazing how even the ones with the sticks and with the little bits of elephant dung become so fascinated by the others and it's almost a case of no matter what I have it can't be as good as what you have um, and they will go bounding over and tend to go and try and steal it from one another and for now everyone seems to be okay about it but it does often happen where the little cubs will chase one another around and try and steal each other's sticks even if there's a perfectly good stick lying not even a centimeter away from them case in point right there look at that oh. oh there's a little rough and tumble been pushed over so James would like to know um, he's asking these lions tend to be suckling quite extensively so they are going to the mother fairly frequently and they are suckling quite a lot and he would like to know what is the frequency that cubs normally suckle at um, and how much milk they will consume and whether or not the female has enough milk to feed the cubs all the time. The answer to that James is that these females being healthy adults um, that are getting a lot of food means that they are producing quite a lot of milk. How much milk they are producing is pretty difficult to to say um, you know it's obviously dependent on how much each one of them drinks sometimes some of them don't drink too much at all they just suckle for a little bit and then they actually just sit there taking a break as they digest the milk that they've taken in um, and so it will depend on on the amount of food she gets the amount of water she has available which will dictate how much milk she is producing for the little ones now we've seen these guys suckle quite a lot this afternoon um, as you stated and the reason is is that probably during the hot part of the day these little cubs didn't actually feed too much so it was too hot the females were probably quite um, irritated at that stage and so after the initial feeding from this morning when the the cubs would have had a good feed around sunrise um, I would imagine that there's been a lot of sleeping and so this is now just because it's getting cooler the cubs are going to have their next feed for the day and so generally they actually don't suckle that much um, we've just been very fortunate that we've watched multiple bouts of suckling this afternoon in a lot of the other lines that I've seen sometimes they'll just suckle once for the afternoon and that will be the end of it until the following day um, but these guys have been lucky mom has been very tolerant and produced quite a bit of milk for them this afternoon Look at that, so we've got the cub on the mom's face, the paws are in the air, isn't that just spectacular? The viewers that like to get screen grabs, that is an incredible one to get. Um, the paws giving a nice indication of the size of the little cub as well as the affectionate um, behavior of being wrapped up in mom's arms. And look at that, we've got a little hug going on. Oh, we're biting mom's paw, that's naughty. We've ruined the nice picture. And mom is now rolled over. The other one that was suckling is not impressed, but no matter, we'll just climb over mom and start drinking again. But isn't that spectacular, eh? We are so fortunate just to be able to watch this and see these mothers interacting. Oh, jungle gym. Look at that. So Dark Knight would like to know how often these lionesses hunt. Now, Dark Knight, that is a very, very good question. And it is one, again, that can be quite relative to the area so obviously it will be quite dependent on the amount of food that they come across and also being the fact that they are opportunistic cats they typically will take any opportunity that they can get but if we had to average out the amount of days that they will end up hunting it would probably be about every two to three days that they will hunt um, sometimes it can be more than that and in conditions like now where we're having this drought and a lot of the animals are suffering and are, are weak in state um, the lions will be taking advantage of that and so in all likelihood will probably be hunting almost every day at this stage um, particularly with a pride like this where you've got five adult females and these little cubs like we were talking about that are taking a lot of nutrition through suckling they will end up having to require quite a lot of food so I'd imagine that they'd be typically hunting most nights 
mates at the moment and if the males are with them even more so right now though it doesn't look like any hunting is going on as <laughs> females are fast asleep at this stage and are really not too interested in doing too much um, but I am sure there's plenty of time for that. The nights are still long as we are still kind of easing our way out of winter. And so there will be plenty of time in the darkness when the lions really come into their own with their excellent night vision. Um, as well as that camouflage that you can imagine at night becomes very difficult to see them. And so I'm sure later tonight there will be a little bit of movement from these guys. And let's hope that they are successful during the evening. It would be quite nice to find them tomorrow morning on some sort of a, a carcass. But I would imagine that before any hunting takes place, due to the, like I was saying to you, the, the amount of heat that we've had today, I'm pretty sure these lionesses are going to make their way to the pan in front of Juma. So those who are on the Juma pan cam, keep a lookout for these guys tonight. I'm pretty sure they're going to rock up there. Um, it's not too far away, and they might go for a little drink before carrying on their nightly patrol. Um, so all of you that are up and awake and, and are busy on the cam, look out for them. Bit of competition over food there. But yeah, it looks like everybody is still quite settled at this stage. The cubs are obviously still playing and having their little game. Um, there's a little group on the right hand side um, of the female that's uh, having a little bit of fun there. Unfortunately, it's a little bit behind the tree, so we can't see too much. But yes, they are busy pulling at one another. other's look at that one is being dragged by its neck by a smaller cub i don't think that is going to last very long i'm pretty sure that bigger cub if it has to stand up we'll send the smaller one running there we go let's see if there's a bit of backlash on this one oh that is a very brave little cub tackling the older sibling oh look at that let me just go forward a little bit for you so you can see it should be able to roll forward Almost there. Oh, no. And the little one is now moved off, unfortunately. There we go, look at that. Oh, and mom's tail is now the source of entertainment again. This again is not going to end well, I don't think. Look, it is being shaken and pulled like it's a part of a carcass. And because the tail moves, it's far more entertaining than anything else. It, uh, obviously is attached to something so there's a little bit of tension when it pulls also the fact that it's fluffy and soft and it moves look at that you can see the little one is like i'm going to get that tail there's no chance that that tail is getting away from me oopsie wait a bush is in the way first amazing what a tolerant mother as well sure she didn't even growl that time and look at this little one Oh, and what have we found there? The little one's busy playing with a pile of leaves under the gory bush, which, like I say, has had a bit of a torrid time this afternoon. Unfortunately, it's been the source of much entertainment for many of these little ones. There's been lots of biting on that little stump that you see on the right side of the screen, and lots of leaves, as you can see, lying on the ground that have been pulled off and have been chewed on. And so the poor gory tree has lost a few more leaves during this drought. Um, they tend to be quite tanninous. And so they tend to be very bitter in taste. That's why we see a lot of those green leaves. You can imagine in the drought that all the antelope species are looking for green leaves as much as possible. Yet these are still quite prominent. And that's because they are very bitter. And so I'm quite surprised that this little cub has been chewing on them and hasn't really found them to be distasteful. Although now we've turned our attention back to the stick again. But isn't that just the sweetest, sweetest little face? Look at that. absolutely beautiful you can see the stick is actually wet from all the saliva from them playing with it it's been absolutely bombarded by lions in fact i don't think the stick has had a moment to itself today it has been absolutely chomped on and played with and moved about all over the place so much so that it is now drenched it's almost like a mongoose when they have their little territorial disputes Alright guys, and so as we say goodbye to these 
beautiful, beautiful, beautiful lionesses. Um, I'm just going to say thank you very much for all of you that watched today um, and for having me on the show. It's been an absolutely incredible experience. I've loved every minute of it. And to be able to spend time with these cubs has been absolutely spectacular. And so from me and from Dave, I'd just like to say thank you to all of you and hopefully see you guys again. And we'll be linking across to the Fireside Chat and I hope you guys have a wonderful evening with Jamie and James at the Fireside.